Welcome to Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman, the only show where a six-time New York Times best-selling author and world-renowned Bible scholar uncovers the many fascinating, little-known facts about the New Testament, the historical Jesus, and the rise of Christianity. I'm your host, Megan Lewis. Let's begin. Today's episode focuses on schisms within early Christianity. What did early Christian groups believe? Why were their beliefs so different? And how did they deal with their contradictory claims? Also, what happened to them? Why don't they exist anymore? But before that, but good morning. How are you doing this week? Yes, uh, good morning. I'm doing well. So uh, classes are going along. And uh, uh, as, you, as you know, I was on leave last semester. And so I'm uh, introduced to a new uh, form of reality, <laughs> the old <laughs> form of reality. Uh, and uh, yeah, I was thinking the other day, you know, I started teaching in 1984. <laughs> I told, I told my students at Chapel Hill that my, uh, my I first started teaching there in 1988. They started looking at each other like, oh, my God, <laughs> my, my parents were in grade school. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so it's an old reality. But here we go again. Yeah. So how, how are things on your end? Yeah, really good. Thank you. I um, you, um, you've got the... this other thing going on. This uh, digital Hammurabi thing. What What is that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, digital Hammurabi is... Um, it's a like public outreach and education YouTube channel and podcast, and we self-publish various books aiming to make Mesopotamia and the ancient world more accessible to interested lay people. Because wow. okay. well, we, we looked around and realized that everyone knows about the pyramids and the pharaohs and relatively few people can tell you an awful lot about Mesopotamia. And yes. Josh yes. and I are both the Syriologists. We think Mesopotamia is awesome. So uh we decided to try and share it with people who might be is interested. Is this a regular podcast that you do? Or? Um, it, it used to be, and then I had eight bazillion children. <laughs> so at the moment, it's kind of, it. we update as and when uh, we have time, but we do interviews, primarily interviews with academics on whatever area of research they're particularly interested in. So we've okay. done, um, and we cover eight bits of Egyptology and, and Hebrew Bible ancient yep. world things but i try and focus on mesopotamia okay. so the um the interview i'm trying to schedule at the moment is with a linguist looking at why we know or why we call sumerian an, a language isolate a language with no known relatives oh. because quite often you will get people saying oh it's it's the same as it's the same language family as chinese or finnish or swedish chinese. or really? all of these yes huh. okay. apparently um the, Tellingly, they're almost always people with no linguistic training. Yes, sir. And uh, yeah, a lot of it seems to be looking at um, mm, tentative similarities. So I, I wanted to talk uh -huh. to a linguist about how, how we know Sumerian actually isn't related to these languages and how we would go about trying to form a connection if we find another language that we think is related. But Megan, you're making the mistake of thinking that expertise matters. <laughs> I know, I know. It's it's Why a can't anybody on the internet just I say it really it's Mandarin. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. I should I should really just just sit and, and listen to everyone who knows better than me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, that's interesting. So it's uh, that's called the dig that's called digital Hammurabi. Hammurabi. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Good. I want to hear more about that down the road. Down the line. <laughs> it's 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 a lot of fun. It yeah. keeps me busy. Yeah. 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 Um, so we should get into early Christianity, which is, as I'm sure our audience will be shocked to hear, not something I know a lot about. Um, why do you think it's important, Bart, to know about early divisions in Christianity? Well, you know, I, you know, a lot of people today still think of Christianity as one thing. Um, my, my students at Chapel Hill, um, most of them have grown up in churches in the South. Um, they tend to be uh, fairly conservative evangelical churches, and um, they think that the Christianity is that, and that something else isn't really Christianity, you know, like those Roman Catholics, I'm not sure what they are, Greek Orthodox, you know, Mormons, I, these are not like, oh, they're not Christian. But in reality, I mean, these are all people who, uh, the, all these denominations and many, many more, um, believe that Christ is the way of Jesus Christ is the way of salvation. They all have, you know, they all have the Bible. They all have, you know, rich baptism and Eucharist and stuff. And so they're, so they, you know, they are, you know, they're, 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 they're Christian. Um, 
even though people say, yeah. <laughs> but so if you look at Christianity today, it's it is so massively diverse. You get you know, you get Greek Orthodox priests and you get Appalachian snake handlers, uh, you know, and you get liberal Presbyterians and you get Jehovah's Witnesses and you get Mormons and you get, uh, you know, Methodist, whatever. I mean, it's like so what a lot of people realize, yeah, that's happened. And I think a lot of people think people, some a lot of people with kind of historical knowledge might think, well, that happened at the Reformation. Right. It was all the Catholic Church. Then the Protestants came along and they just couldn't get along. So they kept splitting and splitting and splitting and splitting. So that's why we have all this diversity. And to some extent, that that's, of course, is true. What people don't realize is that Christianity was always diverse and that the diversity in early Christianity was far more significant than anything we see today. <laughs> uh, there are people, Christians in the early, people who identified themselves as followers of Jesus, who believe they, they kept his teachings, who had sat sacred texts that they said were written by apostles, that they believe were written by apostles, that held to views that are that would be seem bizarre and off the wall to all of these groups today. <laughs> and the, the idea is that one of, the, one of these ancient groups ended up establishing what was the uh, what became the Christian Church in broad broad outline, and so so I'm really I've been for years and years really interested in the diversity of early Christianity and this massive profusion of different kinds of of Christian beliefs and practices. I want to um, go back to something you just said that modern Christianity has this really distinct way of dealing with differences in belief. It's that oh well you're not a real Christian because you believe differently to me, so the ancient world that that christianity kind of came up in was a very polytheistic society and you didn't really have that kind of idea it, it doesn't matter that you believe differently to me your beliefs are as valid as my beliefs where then did this idea come from and was it present in the ancient christian sects that we're going to be talking about today yeah, these these modern debates, like you know, when I was an evangelical Christian, you know, when I, for example, was at Moody Bible Institute, where a, basically I was a fundamentalist, and and you know, we just thought, yeah, those you know, those Methodists, they ain't Christian, <laughs> Catholics, I don't know what they are, but man, oh my God, and so that attitude um, was goes back way back in early Christianity, so that various groups of people who said that they had the truth. Uh, which is what virtually <laughs> most of the groups seem to have said. They, they thought these other groups were not really followers of Jesus, not really Christian. They were heretics or they were outliers and things. And the, where it came from is really interesting because you're, you're completely right. In the, in the Greek and Roman worlds, out of which Christianity emerged, um, there were hundreds and thousands of religions with all sorts of different gods and even like a god like Zeus, who's like in a lot of places, different places had different kinds of Zeus, <laughs> you know, and they had different ways of worshiping him. And they, and because everybody was polytheistic, uh, except for Jews, uh, since everybody was polytheistic, everybody knew there was multiple gods and there are multiple ways to worship the gods. And, uh, and so, you know, it didn't matter because they're all worthy of worship. And none of these religions, this is one of the weirdest things. We probably, we, we, we'll do an episode or so on this. One of the weird things about ancient religion is that it really didn't matter what you believed because religion wasn't about your, like, your belief about the divine. It was about your your religious practices. You're 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 pleasing the divine people, the gods, by sacrifices and by prayers. And you it, the gods wanted to be worshipped. They didn't want you to agree to a bunch of propositional facts. <laughs> they wanted they wanted to be worshipped. And so, but Christianity came along, and I think it happened right off the bat. It's one of the most interesting phenomena in in the history of religion that Christianity unlike everyone else, insisted that there's only one way to be right with the divine realm. There's only one God, and there's only one way to worship the God, and it's through his one son, and you have to believe in X, Y, and Z, or you will not be able, and you need to do X, Y, and Z, or you will not be able to be to have salvation. And so Christians insisted on that. Now, they got the idea of the one God, of course, from Judaism, but Jews you know, Jews in the ancient world did not insist you become a Jew in order to be right with God. They didn't care if you became a Jew. They were Jews. <laughs> like, just leave us alone. We, we, we've got our, you got your gods fine. You, you know, you may be wrong about that, but it's not going to matter because none of these people really much believe that there's an afterlife. And so 
So it was a very, very fluid situation with Jews being an exception in the ancient world. Everyone else very, very fluid. And Christians came along and said, no, uh, one God, one son, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one, it's one. It's not a bunch of things. And you got to get the right one. <laughs> and so that's that's kind of where that's where it started. And Christianity started out as an exclusivistic religion, uh, even though there were lots of different views of it. So you said that there was relatively little conflict because people believed I'm going to rephrase that. There was relatively little conflict around what one should believe because people had different beliefs and, and different ways to practice their religion. And, and as long as there was a religious practice, generally, that's all fine. In contrast, and we'll see this further through the episode, these early Christian groups didn't really play very well together. <laughs> and there, it led to a lot of infighting. What was it about Christianity that led to this conflict that we don't see in polytheistic religions? Yeah. You know, I mean, poly polytheistic religions, of course, they had boundaries. I mean, everybody has boundaries. But they, you know, the idea that you believe this about Zeus or that about Zeus had nothing to do with anything, really. Um, but, yeah, the Christians come along. And, and the reason the Christians start having – oh, I was going to say, the, the pagans do have boundaries. I mean, if, if, you, if you engage in religious practices that are socially dangerous, like if you, if you, you practice human sacrifice or something, you know, or if, you are, uh, if you're antisocial or if you, if you refuse to worship, you know, the god of the city for some crazy reason, you know, they, they did have boundaries. So they had some boundaries. It's like – but – you know, but Christianity came along and it did, it had this exclusive focus. And it's precisely because of this exclusivity that you have so much infighting um, because there develops the idea um, in, in Christianity that there are, uh, that there's one religious truth. Whereas in pagan religions, there are many paths to the divine. And uh, you have a path and I have a path. I prefer my path. You prefer your path. But, you know, we're, actually, you can walk both paths as you want. And so so there are various routes to the divine. But in Christianity, there's one way. So Christ is the way, the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through him, as, as it says in the Gospel of John. And so if there's only one way, you better go the right way. And if people are going the wrong way, um, that's a problem for them. But it's also a problem because they lead other people astray going the wrong way. And so the fighting became fairly intense between these uh, various groups. So it, it rarely came to you know, swords, but it did, uh, it did lead to very, very serious uh, polemical situations. Okay, we should probably look at some specific groups and to try and keep our discussion in, under some semblance of control. I'm going to limit us just to four, because I know there are many more than that. Um, but the Gnostics, the Ebionites, uh, the Marcionites, and the Proto-Orthodox. We obviously don't have time to go into large amounts of detail, and as ever, we will have, <clears throat> excuse me, as ever, we will have specific episodes on each of these groups to look at yeah. them a little bit further. But to begin, did these four groups exist at the same time and in the same place? So, so uh, yeah, these are, these are, I mean, these are broad umbrella category groups. Um, that uh, that there was a lot of variation within them. You know, it's kind of like say, you know, if you've got the Gnostics, you know, you could say it's kind of like the Protestants. <laughs> you know, there there's like you know you got the Baptists and the Methodists, and you got the you know you got the there a wide range of things, but there's some things that they hold in common. It's kind of like that with the Gnostics, and and so these groups um, are are first identified as groups, the uh, groups of various groups of Gnostics, you have groups of Marcionites, groups of, of, uh, of Ebonites, groups of, uh, and so uh, they all exist at, they do exist at the same time in the second century. Um, they, there are big debates among scholars about when each one of them arose. They all claim to go back to Jesus, right? And they all, they all claim to go back to the beginning, but, but you don't find these distinctive groups, at, at least you don't find evidence of them until the second century and they go on to the second and third century. And it's not until Christianity pretty much takes over the Roman Empire that you start having a much more kind of unified sense that this is what it means to be a Christian and, you know, this other thing, not, not so much. Were they operating in the same parts of the world or, or are they geographically more distinct? Well, this is one of the interesting, uh, one of the really interesting questions and, and one of the most important. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background, 
historians of Christianity have always known that there were these various groups with different beliefs and different practices. Um, and that knowledge, of course, goes back to when they were being attacked by their enemies. <laughs> and so the one group that um, there, there's a group that ends up emerging as defining what Christianity is going to be for all time. And for example, saying that there's only one God and that he's the creator of the world, that Christ is his son and that Christ, uh, Christ is both a human and divine. And so most people hearing that today would say, yeah, of course that's Christian. <laughs> yes. But in the early centuries, there were people who said there are two gods. Uh, the God of the Old Testament literally was not the God of the New Testament. Or there were groups that said there are 36 gods. Or uh, there was a group we know of that said there are 365 gods. These are really gods. And so, and or that Christ was a human, but he wasn't God. Or that he was God, but he wasn't human. Or that there actually Jesus Christ is two things, two separate things. A God and a human are temporarily put together. And so you get you get these various things. You get these various views uh, uh, going on. The group that ended up being victorious uh, is what today people call orthodoxy. So orthodoxy means uh, somebody who has the correct belief, orthodoxy. And somebody who believes in uh, something else is uh, usually called a heretic. <laughs> so heresy, uh, heresy and orthodoxy both come from the Greek. So orthodoxy is from two Greek words that mean the, the correct and correct opinion or right belief. Heresy act literally means choice. <laughs> and heretic for people who chose to believe the wrong beliefs <laughs> and to do the wrong practices. And so you do get these uh, descriptions going back to, uh, to the early church. And what's happened historically is that scholars from the fourth century on, and actually with roots deeper than that said, that orthodoxy was always the original thing the right belief is what Jesus taught, taught his disciples, taught the others. They it passed on down. And every now and then a heretic would come along and like mess it up. Like they'd be driven by the devil and they'd be have bad intent and, you know, or they'd be stupid or they'd be, you know, up with some crazy idea. And, you know, they'd have some followers, but basically God was in control and he squashed them. So that was the view for hundreds and hundreds of years until the early 20th century, until the 20th century, that basically... Orthodoxy was the primary thing, the major thing, always the major thing, goes all the way back, and heresies were kind of these offshoots. And today, uh, scholars have, many, most historical scholars have a different view of that. They think that, in fact, these diverse things are going on all at once, including the predecessors of the Orthodox. And they were in competition with the Gnostics and with the Marcionites and with the, the Ebionites and with all these other groups. And they ended up being victorious. And then they rewrote the history of the engagement. <laughs> they said, we've always been in the majority. Uh, and so all of the writings that come down, come down from them. And not all of them, but yeah. Right. Did that answer your question? <laughs> kind of, kind of. Were there, were there then like pockets of of Marcionites and pockets of, of proto-Orthodox and pro pockets of Gnostics, or did these people all kind of intermingle and attend in the uh, same churches right. and live in the right. same communities? Yeah, right. Okay, you were asking, right, location, geography. So here's the deal. There are, uh, there's very good evidence that you had uh, communities of Christians, like in a, in a city, say in the city of Antioch, or in the city of Alexandria, Egypt, or in where you had large churches where you could have a variety of groups represented all at the same time. And um, some of the, uh, so uh, you were using the term proto-Orthodox, and that's the term that I use to refer to people who held the view that became orthodoxy before it became the dominant view, right? So before it's dominant, you got to call them something. They're not orthodox yet in the sense that they're, they're not the dominant view. So I call them proto-orthodox, as do many, uh, most other people. But so the idea, though, is you get these proto-orthodox authors in the third, fourth centuries who are saying things like, yeah, be careful when you're traveling over to Antioch, you know, because if you go in there, you got to make sure that's not a Marcionite church, you know, or if you go to Ephesus or some, or, uh, you know, these Gnostics, they, they're in our congregations. They sound just like us, but then they don't. They say the same words. They mean very different things by them. And so, so they were. There was intermingling, um, but there were areas that were more dominantly one than another. Uh, and so, this was the breakthrough that happened in the 20th century: is that scholars started looking at our oldest sources by location, by geography, and they tried to find our oldest Christian sources for Alexandria, Egypt. 
and for Antioch in Syria and for Asia Minor and for Rome and for, you know, and they went to the, and they looked at the ancient sources and they found some places, all of the ancient sources appear to be Gnostic. The earliest form of Christianity in this region, say in Egypt, appears to have been Gnostic. And you go to, um, you go to, uh, you know, what would be now Turkey to Asia Minor. So Eastern Asia Minor, that looks like almost everybody we know of early on was from was connected with the Marcion. They were Marcionites. And so so there are regional um, majorities, but there's also a lot of intermixing here and there. I see. So how then do we know about these groups? What sources do we have and uh, what biases maybe should we be careful of when we're looking at these ancient sources? Yeah, this is, you know, for any historian, the key to, the key to every claim, uh, the, key, the key is always sources. <laughs> How do you know that? Uh, most people know things about these groups and about Christianity, about everything else by looking it up on the Internet. And somebody tells them something and say, oh, that's what it is. <laughs> We're all guilty of that. But for historians who want to know. They have to figure out, well, what are our sources? And what, as you said, what are their biases and prejudices? And can we trust them? And do they conflict with each other? And how do we? So the deal with these various groups is that, as I said, for you know, basically 1900 years, everybody understood them to be offshoots of what was really orthodox. And um, the reason for thinking that is because our sources of information were always orthodox sources proto-Orthodox in the second and third centuries sources, and then Orthodox sources, which were Christians who were attacking these people for their views. And so if you wanted to know what the Gnostics thought, you would read an author like Irenaeus, who's a late second century uh, church father whose writings we have. Uh, you can get them in English in five volumes. This big, big book that's called Against the Heresies. And he describes these various heresies, and he shows why they're so ridiculous. Um, so for centuries, that was our only information were church fathers who were attacking these groups to know what they thought. But, you know, you just think about that for a second. If you really wanted to know in this last election uh, what, what Joe Biden thought, you know, is Trump going to be your best person to ask? You know, or if, you know, in the in, in earlier elections, you know, if you got, you know, if you want to know like Nixon's views, do you do you really want to ask Kennedy? I mean, you know, I mean, he's a nice guy and everything, but, you know, he might like slant things. Uh, some people slant them a little bit. Some people slant them a lot. And when you're attacking your enemy and there's no your enemy has no recourse, no way to answer back to you. It's easy to say all sorts of things. And so people wonder, yeah, you know, are these reliable reports? You know, the, these poor Orthodox are attacking their enemies. Can we trust them? And people basically say, oh, yeah, he's telling the truth. He's just telling the way it is, you know. And so but then we started discovering ancient writings <laughs> from these groups, especially the Gnostics. And we found we found a lot of not a lot. We, we, we found Gnostic writings and turns out, whoa, wait a second. A lot of what Irenaeus says is is right. Uh, although he does kind of, but there are some things, oh man, he's just wrong about that. that. He's just making that up, you know? And so, so we can, so you have to evaluate these. So you've got to evaluate the sources and it isn't just a matter of reading them and kind of, it means it's like spending your lifetime studying these sources in relationship to one another and in relationship to other realities that we know about and devoting yourself to it and then come drawing your conclusions. I see. This is, a big question, I know. So apologies in advance. Are there any defining features that we can use to talk about these particular groups? What did they believe that was distinct to them? Yeah, uh, the answer is yes. Um, I uh, probably best to take them group by group. Um, and so, uh, well, I mean, so the proto-Orthodox, uh, the proto-Orthodox will sound familiar to most people because they insisted that there's, uh, as I said before, there's only one God, the, the God of the Jews. He chose the Jewish people. He gave them the law. Uh, Christ, uh, the, the law couldn't save them. So God sent Christ, his son, who is both human and divine. And his death uh, brought about salvation. He was raised from the dead, bodily raised from the dead and taken up in, into heaven. And the only way to have salvation is by believing in his death and resurrection. So that, that, that will sound like Christianity to most people today. Uh, because it's the view that did become Christianity. Um, if you take a group like the Ebionites, the Ebionites are uh, were. That's a term. It's a complicated term because scholars use it in a variety of ways. But it's 
and we're not even sure exactly where the term came from, but it's referring to people who uh, were ethnically Jewish. They were born and raised Jewish or had converted to Judaism, I guess, who uh, believed that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah, um, who, but who maintained their Jewishness, who believed that when God gave the law uh, to the Jews, he said that it's an eternal covenant. Uh, circumcising baby boys is God calls it an eternal covenant when he gives it to Abraham. And they believed he meant eternal. It means it's not going to end. It's eternal. And so they thought that the law was continue, continued to be in force. And to be a follower of Jesus, you had to continue keeping the law. You had to keep kosher. You had to observe the Sabbath. You kept the festivals. You, you know, I mean, you, you did the circumcise. You did the things. And that the, keeping the law was was bound up with having salvation because if you're not if you're not following God's law you're not on His side and so so they were basically a form of kind of Jews who were Christians and Christians who were Jews doing both things at once. Um, so when you get to somebody like the Marcionites, the Marcionites are followers of a man named Marcion um, who had kind of the opposite view. In fact, pretty much the opposite view. Marcion thought that uh, that the Apostle Paul was the one who nailed it. Paul differentiated between the gospel of Christ and the law of the Jews. And Paul said, you don't have to keep the law in order to be a follower of Jesus. That was a useful message for Paul historically because he was preaching to Gentiles, to pagans. And he's basically telling them, look, you don't got to get circumcised and, you know, you can eat ham sandwiches and you can, you know, it's like you don't have to be a Jew. And so, you know, if Paul hadn't done that, you know, I doubt if he would have converted you know, lots of people. But he but he had that message. He converted lots of people. So Marcion thought Marcion, who's living 100 years later, thought Paul, he's in the second century. He thought Paul really had gotten it right, that there's a difference between the law and the gospel. In fact, they're antithetical. Marcion thought that the God who gave the law was not the God of Jesus. They were different gods. Uh, and that, and that, um, and so he believed in two gods, the God who created this world, who called Israel, his people, uh, and, uh, gave them all these laws. That's, that's the, the just God, the, the very righteous, but wrathful God who gives you a law you can't keep. And so sends you to hell for it. <laughs> Jesus comes from a different God. Who's above that God, who has never had anything to do with his world. And he sent that he sent Jesus into the world to save people from the wrathful God of the Old Testament. And so you got the wrathful God of the Old Testament and the righteous God and the, and the loving God of the New Testament. So Marcion categorized that and he said, okay, that's what it is. Uh, so he, he, he not only doesn't think you should keep the Jewish law, he doesn't think the Old Testament is a Christian book. Uh, it's a Jewish book. So Jews have their religion, Christians have theirs. And they're completely different. The Gnostics are the most complicated because there are so many different kinds of Gnostic groups, uh, but they have a different thing altogether. <laughs> Their view is that this world, they agree with Marcion that this world is not the creation of the good God, uh, but they have a very different way of doing it where they, they have an entire realm of divine beings that came into existence sometime in eternity past. A whole bunch of beings, depending on which Gnostic group you're following, you know, 12 beings, 36 beings, 365 beings who are all divine beings. And that there was a, the, before the world existed, this divine realm came into being. And one of the divine beings in this divine realm fell out of the divine realm. And it was a cataclysmic event in the cosmos that led to the creation of this world by an evil divinity. And the goal of the goal of the religion is to learn the secret knowledge that allows you to escape the grasp of this evil divinity. This evil divinity created the material world. We're material beings. Some of us actually are spiritual beings who've been trapped in this material world. And the goal is to allow our spirit to escape our bodily entrapment to return back to the heavenly realm. And the way that happens is not by faith in Jesus. It's by understanding his secret teachings. So the word Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, which, which means knowledge. These are groups that emphasize the importance of secret knowledge for salvation. Okay, so, so that, yeah, that, that in kind of a nutshell is, is what these groups are. So that gives us some insight into the differences in what these groups believed and their, their distinctions. What did they believe that was the same? 
Oh uh, yeah, so that it's a good question, and as it turns out, it's a little bit harder to answer. <laughs> uh, these groups would probably have denied that they had anything in common. That <laughs> they said, "Yeah, that ain't you know." They they don't believe anything like we do. But in fact, if you look at it from a broad perspective, uh, there are a number of very important similarities uh, among the groups, even though within the similarities there are going to be major differences. But they all they all, for example, believe in a divine realm. Uh, and that it's important to uh, have a correct understanding of this divine realm. They all believe that uh, that the world was created by one by uh, by a divine being, uh, and that humans uh, are a result of divine activity. Uh, they believe that that Jews and Judaism have something to do with Christianity. Um, that there's some kind of relationship between Judaism specifically uh, and Christianity. They all think that Jesus is very important uh, and a cent- is the central part of the religion, uh, and that uh, understanding who Jesus really is and uh, and and having the correct understanding of Jesus is 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 very uh, very important. Um, they all think that their uh, views of Jesus are what will bring salvation. And they think that the um, that their views can be authorized by written texts. Now, I emphasize that point because in the Greek and Roman worlds broadly, their written texts were not part of religion in, for the most part. I mean, no, the, the ancient religion, Greek and Roman religions did not have Bibles. It's like Homer wasn't a, the Iliad and the Odyssey. They weren't Bibles, you know, in mythology weren't Bibles. They, but but. Christians did have written texts, and they the each group said that their views were authorized by written texts, specifically texts written by apostles, and so they all agreed that apostolic uh, writings were key to understanding the truth of the religion, and so they all have these things, and, and you know their ultimate goal is salvation uh, that comes through Jesus as authorized by these texts. That's a, a very much a whistle stop tour through the four. Let's say the main early sects of, of Christianity. I have one more question before we move on with the rest of the podcast. How is it that proto-orthodoxy was ultimately successful in becoming the correct Christianity, while other groups were dismissed as heretical and, and abandoned? Yeah, now here's a big debate. <laughs> oh boy. So um this is um this became a major debate uh about 90 90 years ago, uh, there's a German scholar named Walter Bauer uh, who wrote a book in German that the English title is Orthodoxy and Heresy in Earliest Christianity. And he's he's the first one who really pushed this idea that it's not that there was like one orthodoxy and that various heretics kind of split off, but that in different regions, there were different majorities. And it looks like Christianity started out in Egypt differently from the way it started out in Syria and it started out differently in Asia Minor than it started in Rome. And, you know, and so he, he did these things regionally. And so his question was, why did, why did this one group win? And the short story is that he, he thinks that the, the proto-Orthodoxy, what we're calling proto-Orthodoxy was located in other, in other places, but is very much the majority view in the city of Rome. And Rome, of course, was the capital of the Roman Empire. It was the largest city in the empire by far. It had, uh, as a city, it had far more resources, a lot of administrative skill there. And the church became very big there and started to assert its influence on other churches, uh, influence that it could it could assert both because it had huge administrative skill, but also because it had a lot of money. And so it could use its money in ways to, to influence uh, other other church communities. And that eventually what ends up happening is that this Roman form of Christianity starts starts spreading farther and farther and to influence things more and more. Uh, when the Roman emperor converted to Christianity in the early fourth century, uh, Constantine, um, naturally his the, the kind of Christianity he was familiar with was the Roman form of Christianity. And eventually then that becomes the the form of Christianity that takes over the Roman world, even though there were other groups still in the fourth and fifth centuries, but that's the dominant view. And so it's a Roman form of Christianity. And because it's a worldwide uh, phenomenon by the fourth, fifth, sixth centuries, um, the word for universal in Greek is Catholic, 
Catholicos. And so that is then, that's the Catholic Church. And since it comes out of Rome, it's the Roman Catholic Church. And so that's that's how uh, Bauer understands that it took over by asserting it, the Roman influence. And I, I, you know, I think I think virtually all the details of Bauer's very impressive book are problematic in one way or another. But I think the over I think the overall picture is pro, is pretty close to being right, and that um, and that it's not an accident <laughs> that this form of Christianity you can find in, along with others, but you can find this form in Rome. I think it's not an accident that it's the one that ends up taking over the world. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your knowledge with us on this fascinating topic. And I'm looking forward to diving a little bit more deeply into the specific yes. sects in later yeah. episodes. We are going to take a brief break and we will be right back with uh, Bart's update where we get to find out what Bart is up to this week. If you're enjoying the Misquoting Jesus podcast, you'd probably like my online courses as well. I've produced a number so far with multi-lecture courses on the New Testament Gospels and the books of the Pentateuch, standalone lectures on the Christmas story and the earliest Christian views of Jesus, and a six-hour debate on whether Jesus was actually raised from the dead. If you're interested, check them out at bartherman.com. You'll receive a discount on your purchase simply by entering the code MJPODCAST. Are you a curious person with a passion for learning, but don't want to go back to school? You need to take a look at Wondrium, the streaming service that provides classes on just about everything of interest. The Crusades, neuroscience, Beethoven, photography, travel, and lots else. All presented by true experts in accessible terms. For a free trial, go to barterman.com slash Wondrium. If you decide to subscribe to Wondrium, this podcast will receive a referral fee, but that'll have no effect on the cost of your subscription and you'll be supporting our show. Welcome back everyone. It's time for Bart's Weekly Update. This is Bart's Weekly Update, where we get to catch up on all the latest about Dr. Ehrman's book releases, speaking engagements, ermanblog.org happenings and online course launches. But what do you have for us this week? What's going on in your world? Uh, well, you know, right now I'm I'm uh, kind of arranging a couple of speaking things that I'm uh, I'm working on that uh, we've announced on uh, on my my website. But I'm, I'm uh, the the big one is I'm going to be doing this uh, multi uh, lecture course just on the Gospel of Mark. And so this is so much fun for me to uh, do these courses. And the Gospel of Mark, it's, uh, it's one of these, it is such an underappreciated gospel. Uh, and it, in my, it's my favorite book of the New Testament. And so I'm going to do, I'm, I'm working now on this eight, eight lecture course. And for me, the challenge is I'm doing that while I'm trying to teach, you know? And so, so, but it's just so much fun. I can't resist doing these things. And so, so that's, what, that's what I'm up to now. That's, that's, that's what's going on in my world right now. Excellent. Uh, and we are going to have some reflections on life from Bart. In this segment, Bart shares insights from his uncommonly diverse experience as a professor and student, husband and father, and evangelical Christian turned agnostic. This is Bart Reflects on Life. Bart, what do you have for us to think about today? Well, you know, I, I uh, like, like all thinking persons, I, uh, I reflect on a lot of things <laughs> in life. And, um, you know, I, uh, I, I've been pondering a lot of uh, an incident that happened that was reported, I guess it was reported back in January, but it was something that happened last November. There's a, there was an adjunct a professor of art history at a Hamline a University in Minnesota, um, who was a, an, she's an expert on uh, Islamic art. And she was teaching a class on uh, Islamic art, and and people probably know about this incident. Or just to remind them, she she, she was she wasn't doing it as a you know as a Muslim, and she was she was she was celebrating the the greatness of 
Muslim art. And one of the things she was going to do is show a picture of Muhammad, a very famous picture of Muhammad. And uh, there are many devout Muslims who think that it, it, you really cannot show a picture of Muhammad. You cannot. Show, and so she, she in her syllabus, she put in that she's going to do this. If it's offensive to you, don't, you know, don't come to that class. And then before she did it, she said she was going to do it. So I know some of you would, might be offended by this. And, and so she, and then she did it. And one of the students in the class got really upset. This was a devoted, uh, devout Muslim student who got very upset and complained, and it got to the president of Hamline. And this this instructor was an adjunct, meaning doesn't have tenure, doesn't have any protection. And so, in effect, Hamline fired this person uh, for showing the picture for being uh, because they said it was Islamophobic. Uh, so I have to say, um, I. I think this is uh, very scary on all sorts of grounds as an academic, a professional academic who teaches at a university. Uh, universities are founded on academic freedom where professors are experts in a field and they can teach that field the way their expertise takes them. Um, of course, every professor has First Amendment rights, right to speech, as, as everybody does. And there are big debates in the country right now about what that entails. Um, but... For somebody who gets fired for teaching their expertise because a, a Muslim student is upset, I understand a Muslim student being upset, but there were trigger warnings for this. Where does that lead to? I mean, for somebody who teaches religious studies, like me, <laughs> uh, I mean, what 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 if you are offensive to an, to an Orthodox Jew because you say you know Moses never existed, or there really was no Abraham? Do you get fired for that? Or what if you're a Christian teacher and you show that, you know, there are contradictions in the Gospels or that Jesus never called himself God? Do you, can you get fired for that? Uh, and it's a real problem, I think. Uh, I And let me just say, I am, people know this, I'm sure, that I'm culturally, socially, politically, I'm liberal. Uh, I'm And I'm a firm believer in sensitivity and respect for people who have different perspectives. Um, but I'm also a scholar who believes it in the university <laughs> and in the university, you've got people have to teach their areas of expertise without fear of retaliation from administrations and from boards of trustees and boards of governors or to you know, state school from legislatures. Uh, if, if you don't have freedom of academic freedom, then then higher education is sunk. And once you sink higher education, you're sinking, you're sinking a free society for the long term. And so all of this, of course, is part of the bigger bifurcation going on in our culture that is really scary for a lot of us, um, that you've got you've got these two sides where like people think you're crazy. You're you're flipping crazy to be in the middle somewhere. <laughs> it's like, you know, on one side, you get people who are banning books and outlawing the teaching of certain subjects. And on the other side, you've got people who, who, who make it impossible to say or teach anything because you might offend somebody. Uh, and if you offend somebody, you're going to lose your job. And so I just don't know how higher education can happen in a world like this, <laughs> where there's no academic freedom and every, and the academy is being driven by political power. Um, so, you know, I mean, teacher, in my view, so maybe I'm a dinosaur, <laughs> but in my view, teachers have to be able to challenge their students with new and possibly threatening ideas, and they can't be expected simply to toe political lines, either on the extreme right or the extreme left, uh, or to try to do both at once, which is a very interesting tightrope walking act. And so, uh, so that's basically my, my, my rather passionate view of things these days, that if higher education isn't allowed to proceed with academic freedom, we're, and I'm not saying that I know where the line is supposed to be drawn. There have to be lines drawn, obviously, but you know, without academic freedom in this country, we, we are not, we, we're going to destroy ourselves and we're going to, we're going to have a police state. Uh, I'm not sure, we, I'm not sure whether the far right or the far left is going to be the police, but somebody, and so we, we, we don't want that, in my opinion. Absolutely th food for thought. Thank you very much, Bart. Um, before we finish for the week, would you mind summarizing what we talked about and maybe let people know um, book suggestions if they want to know more? Uh, yeah, so so sure. I um, So we, we've been talking about the di diversity of early Christianity and how there were various kinds of gr Christian groups that all claimed that they had the truth as represented by Jesus, the truth about God that could bring salvation. But they were completely at odds with each other and a lot of times at each other's throats. Uh, and only one one of those views ended up winning out and becoming the dominant form of Christianity. That's the form of Christ, the rough form of Christianity that virtually all Christians agree to uh, 
agree to today. And so one of the very interesting studies of early Christianity is trying to unpack that diversity and to understand where it came from and what it was all about. And I've, I've spent a lot, I've spent years and years working on this one because I've, since I was in graduate school, I've been really interested in it. And there is a lot of good literature on it. For somebody who, who really wants to be hardcore, they need to read that book that I was, I, I, I make my graduate students learn this book inside out, <laughs> Walter Bauer's book, Orthodoxy and Heresy and Earliest Christianity. But there are, there are other books. I, I've written a couple books where I deal with this kind of thing. My, my book, Lost Christianities, is about this. Uh, it's a it's a book for a, a lay audience. It's not written for scholars. Um, and another another good thing for people to do is simply to read uh, other other Christian texts uh, from the ancient world. Um, my colleagues Laco Plesha and I, for example, translated forty texts from Greek, Latin, and Coptic that are gospels, other gospels, and most of them are not proto orthodox. <laughs> most of them are Gnostic or this, that, or the other thing. And they're yeah, that, that's an interest. So just reading these things. Is uh, is really is there, quite, quite interesting. Is there an anthology that you might recommend of um, apocryphal texts for people who are interested in non-canonical Christian sources? Yeah, so sources? There, there are several collections, and so if you're just interested in gospels, this is that's the one I would recommend. But if you want kind of the broader range of apocryphal texts, there's a lot of really good ones out. And the, the best, I think, the best one is probably the one by a J.K. Eliot, and it's just called the Apocryphal New Testament. And it has a bunch of it has a bunch of gospel. It doesn't have as many as we have, but it has a bunch of it has the most important ones and books, of acts and epistles and apocalypses that all claim to be written by apostles that, uh, you know, and have some really interesting and somewhat bizarre stuff in them for the modern reader. And so that's what I would really recommend is uh, J.K. Eliot's. Um, uh, the uh, uh, if you don't want a full one, like it, that's a pretty full collection. Uh, if you if you want a kind of selection, I also have a book called Lost Scriptures, where I do the same thing, where I I limit it uh, to the ones that I think are really the the really hot items <laughs> on the list. Uh, and so the, those are some of the things people could look at. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, audience, thank you for listening. I really hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please remember to subscribe to the podcast and make sure you don't miss future episodes. Remember also that you can use the code MJPODCAST for a discount on all of Bart's courses, including that upcoming course on the Gospel of Mark that he was talking about. And you can um, access those over at www.bartehrman.com. Misquoting Jesus will be back next week. Bart, what are we talking about next time? So next week, we're going to deal with the topic we alluded to uh, today, which is uh, I talked about how one form of Christianity ended up taking over the world and that the conversion of Constantine had something to do with that. And and next next week, we're going to look at that particular issue, not about the diversity of Christianity, but about how Christianity starts out of this tiny little group. I mean, in the New Testament, Jesus has, like after his death, there are 11 followers left and a handful of women who come to believe in him off the bat. So 20 people or so, you know, say in the year 30, there are 20 people. By the year 300, there are like 3 million people. <laughs> and by the end of the by the end of the fourth century, it's half of the Roman Empire. Whoa, 30 million people. How, how do you go from 20 people to the 30 million? <laughs> uh, so that's what we're going to be talking about. How you go from this persecuted little group of people to being the official religion of Rome. Beautiful. I hope everyone can join us then. Thank you again, everybody, and goodbye. This has been an episode of Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman. We'll be back with a new episode next Tuesday, so please be sure to subscribe to our show for free on your favourite podcast listening app or on Bart Ehrman's YouTube channel so you don't miss out. From Bart Ehrman and myself, Megan Lewis, thank you for joining us.